And exactly to build on what Nick just uh, mentioned, I do want to thank um, um, everyone. And this, the purpose of this presentation is to think a little more um, deeply and deliberately about the choices we make um, when we design and deliver instruction. And I've tried to design this presentation, as Nick just mentioned, to be useful to everyone, because as he said, there are some people with very deep knowledge who've been working with us um, of some of the pedagogical premises that underlie what I'm about to, to talk about and share with you. So I wanted to start with exactly those two, uh, two of the major underlying premises. The first one is reverse design as a, um, as a, real, as a way of thinking about all the things we do and, and, and the integration of assessment and, and teaching. And reverse design is not a new concept, but um, we, we work with it intensively. It really, it really directs a lot of the work we do. And reverse design begins with, as many of you know, you begin at the end, instead of ending with testing, you begin with thinking about testing, especially the target language use domain, which for us is language use in the real world. We're defining that very specifically. What do our learners do with language in the real world? And we construct tests to measure that. And um, we um, also, we construct, we use constructs, the, the proficiency guidelines, which I'll get to in one second. We construct tests and then we turn to, to curriculum, to thinking about all the choices we make when we are teaching. And we have chosen, we work very intensively with the actual proficiency guidelines and levels, those descriptions in, as our construct. The proficiency guidelines have been around for several decades, as you probably know. And, um, but they also, of course, work very well because they are descriptions of language use in the real world. So we use the guidelines to um, focus um, our, our testing and to identify levels that are, become, that are the outcomes for our learners. So in, that, in this way, with reverse design and focused on the target language, language use domain in the real world and the guidelines, we work in a, in, in a way where proficiency, where uh, assessment and instruction are always aligned. We're always working to align them with each other. At the University of Chicago in the Language Center, we have been engaged with two different projects over the last um, five years. The first one was or is the Mellon Transforming Language Instruction project um, that began in 2016. We're going now embarking on another three years with that project. And the second, which was sort of informed by the Mellon project is our own local language pedagogy innovation initiative. And I'd like to um, thank both the Mellon Foundation, the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation for its funding and continued support. And also thank the University of Chicago College um, and the Humanities Division for its support of the Language Pedagogy Innovation Initiative. And in both of those projects, one of which, the Mellon, we started working with um, Lictal instructors across um, the Big Ten and the Ivy Plus. We're now moving into working with multiple other instructors in other, lang in other languages and institutions. And um, uh, and in the Language Pedagogy Innovation Initiative, the LPII, with our own instructors across virtually all the languages taught at the university. Um, in both of those, we have seen our, these colleagues, our colleagues transform their assessment and instructional practices. And these are the steps that inform or that, um, that direct these projects, these, both of these projects. So our instructors, our colleagues, use the ACTL guidelines to set end of year proficiency outcomes or set end of program, might be the end of a year, end of a minor, end of a major proficiency outcomes. They then design and implement proficiency assessments and use those assessments as an integral part of their curriculum. They then collaborate on the development and realignment of curricula with these proficiency set assessments in mind. They incorporate these materials and testing materials in their teaching, and this allows them then to engage in evaluation of assessments, assessments and curriculum. I'll talk more about that later. And something that's been a byproduct of both of these products is that 
because our colleagues design their own assessments, they are both the agents of the curricular transformation. They have identified the outcomes and designed the assessments, and they are also accountable for that transformation and accountable to their curricula. So this has really engendered uh, a powerful um, agency and expertise in our colleagues that makes it possible for them to take ownership and look at their assessments and curricula as a pedagogical whole and work on their constant realignment and evaluation. So this workshop is really a result of questions from all of these interactions with our colleagues and working on these projects. Um, so how testing and teaching inform each other, how they interact, how they intersect. And in examining these, con these contrasts, I think, you know, help us answer some of the questions that have come up in our work with colleagues in both of these projects. And I'm going to um, talk about these, the teaching and testing in three um, sort of broad um, areas or themes, materials and content, class activities and assessment tasks, and then formative and summative the testing. So I'll get started on that right now. So in materials and content, start there first. So of course we all teach, grammar and vocabulary. And in proficiency-oriented teaching, there was a belief for a while that it meant we didn't teach grammar, especially our vocabulary. But of course we do, but we shift them in, in, in this paradigm and they are a means and a tool for language use or functional language use and not the end in, of the, in and of themselves. So, so grammar and vocabulary become tools that our learners use to use language and function with language. And in our um, course design matrix that we use in our curricular development workshops, you can see that we mention grammar and vocabulary here, but as activities or homework that will make prepare students to use language. So we really connect the dots. Here, this is being taught or practiced, maybe offsite, but it is done to prepare students to use language. And again, in in-class activities, here are activities um, to make sure that they are, our learners are performing the target functions at different levels. That goes back to the proficiency guidelines and blend specific language, grammar, specific vocabulary. So that's the role that grammar and vocabulary play in proficiency-oriented teaching. But in proficiency testing, we don't directly test grammar or vocabulary. Instead, we get to see how our learners retrieve what we have taught and use it when they are performing the functions of the proficiency guidelines or the proficiency criteria. You know, this is a very frustrating part um, of teaching. It's, it's so obvious to us sometimes our learners they know that word, right? Or they, we know that, that we've practiced that form. So why don't they use it, right? It's, that's what's so perplexing sometimes when we're doing proficiency testing. But in the proficiency testing, remember it, proficiency testing should mimic real world language use situations. And if we would drop our learners into the middle of the real world, they're not going to use all the things we taught them in the way that we think they will. Instead, they're gonna be drawing on their own repertoire and using different things that they, that they have learned. You, know, you, ne you never know, we just, we don't always know what our learners are going to draw on when they're confronted with a real world activity. So we, um, so, but we are accountable to prepare our learners for these tests use books that are organized to prevent, to pre prepare our learners for real world contexts. Luckily now many textbooks are organized this way. I remember when I was first teaching in the 1980s, the chapter on the past tense was called the past tense, but now the chapter on the past tense might be called stories and memories. So it's that tie of what we use grammar or vocabulary for when we're doing real world tasks. Again, in proficiency teaching, we don't, um, or proficiency test, the, the next 
the next area I want to look at is in the content that we choose. So we choose content and we practice it or use it in teaching that's appropriate to our learners level and to the targeted outcomes. But in um, proficiency um, testing, we don't, um, we don't ignore, we don't not test a topic, for example, um, well, I didn't teach my students um, shopping in a market, so I can't test them on that in an end of first year or end of second year class. So we have to remember that we're going to, um, as in the real world, our learner will be confronted by unknown topics, by novel situations, and the proficiency tells us how well they're going to be able to function when they're confronted with a topic or a situation they don't know. At the, end of, at the intermediate level, they may have a lot of gaps. It may be very, very difficult for them to function. At the advanced level, they can get around it. They have enough language to use to get around a word they don't know. So again, we're not, proficiency testing is not testing the content we taught, but it's preparing students for the topics they may encounter. In proficiency-oriented teaching, we also use authentic materials um, in, our, in our instruction. And here are some of the many, many reasons that we might use authentic materials. This is from a, a workshop given by my colleague, Karen Maxey, who's here today, also in our um, curriculum development workshop. And there are probably other reasons for using authentic materials related to the language or the culture that you teach. And the turn to the use of authentic materials was probably one of the most significant shifts in teaching, excuse me, as a result of the proficiency movement, if you want to call it that, in communicative language teaching. But the turn to authentic materials also presents an enormous burden on our learners vocabulary knowledge and other cultural knowledge. So there's a, there's a, you know, there's a, there are advantages and disadvantages to the use of authentic materials. And so when we talk about using authentic materials, of course, now we're talking about reading and listening or viewing. So how, how our learners are um, learning those comprehensive comprehension skills or receptive skills. And we can consider a continuum of how we might um, use or modify authentic materials. This is from my another colleague in the Chicago Language Center, um, Ahmed Dursan, who posits this continuum, an original material is one that we don't touch, we don't change at all. Adapted materials may be um, changed, but there's a we preserve the linguistic and cultural authority. So you might only use an excerpt or you might pull chunks of an um, original material out and use several chunks of that material without, without changing them. You might just shorten a text or use a snippet or a, of, a, of a recording or a snippet of a film, but you don't change the language at all. Simplified indicates changes that are linguistic or cultural. So you might change the vocabulary to make the text more accessible. So we're really making changes here that do impact the linguistic or cultural um, authenticity, but we're bending it to our learners' needs. And finally, scripted. These are materials we create ourselves, ranging from everything from dialogues to creating ads or creating facsimiles of what looks like a newspaper article that would be accessible to our students. Some of these might look quite, quite good and look and feel and read like authentic materials and others may not resemble real world language at all. Of course, we would prefer to have, prefer to have the former rather than the latter. So in teaching, we may choose any of the materials along this continuum. And that would be determined by the purpose of that material, right? And this is where also reverse design is going to help us make those decisions, right? So are you trying to give your students an idea of the 
great variety of accents in the language you teach or in colloquial language, you might use a completely original text or completely original recording that would really shock the learner, but still let them know this is what real what the language you might be confronted with in the real world. So learners don't get the idea that the teacher language or the textbook language they hear is the full extent of the target language. Or you might adapt a text. You might, you don't, you know, we, we, we rarely watch an entire movie when we teach. So adapting the text might make it possible to expose the learners to authentic language and to all of the positive aspects of authentic materials while still being able to teach with those materials. At the same time, um, keep in mind too that in teaching, our learners, even with these more challenging versions of authentic texts, have time to process them. They may be reading a text for homework. They may have multiple opportunities to listen to an audio text three or four or five times. So that also will have an impact on how they're how, what, what text you choose or how you choose to use them. Where in a testing situation, the learner may only have the opportunity to hear a text twice. Or three times, and that will also, you know, change the, the kind of text you're going to want to use. Now, in thinking about in thinking about um, about testing, the guidelines help us think about or manage the authenticity of inputs in proficiency testing. All right, so think about the novice level. So a novice, I'm, I'm going to refer to the um, criteria, assessment criteria for speaking. You know, we know that the novice, um, even with a sympathetic listener, even with the opportunity to hear something multiple times, there still may be, it may be very difficult for the novice to comprehend that language. So using an authentic material for a novice level proficiency test probably doesn't make sense. Teaching with it, They'll, be, they'll discover they can pick out individual words. Testing with it might be very, very problematic and really frustrate, not only frustrate your learners, but not give you the evidence you need, okay? Think about the intermediate. The intermediate still needs repetition, but they can handle some adapted materials. So we, we still have the idea of the sympathetic listener in proficiency, speaking proficiency at the intermediate level, that is a guide for us to think about the fact that in testing we may want in testing we may want to use adapted or simplified materials or even scripted materials, ideally those that sound more authentic. But when we get to the advanced level, and remember at the advanced level for speaking, when we get to the advanced level, the advanced level speaker can be understood by anyone in the target culture. So this is an indication that listeners or readers at the advanced level, when confronted with authentic language, should be able to manage and get, get around any gaps. All right, and of course, at the superior level, any material may be appropriate if it serves the purpose of our testing. So again, thinking about this range of authenticity and thinking about how the different levels already indicate how well a learner can grapple with authentic language can guide us in how we want to use, language, use authentic materials, what types of authentic materials. So moving now to our next set of themes, class activities and assessment tasks. So in proficiency oriented teaching, the question uh, very often comes up at what level to teach, can I go beyond the level of my learners, beyond the targeted level? And we emphatically, or I would emphatically say yes. Learners, we, we need to stretch, if you wanna use that term, our learners beyond their level to ensure that all learners reach the targeted level. All right, this, is, this has many, many echoes in um, applied linguistics and in the field of second language teaching and learning, maybe the earliest being Krashen's I plus one model, where Krashen posited the, um, the concept that at the I plus one, that is where learning occurs or acquisition occurs, all right? But if you think also, we have another way to think about this question, and that is in 
proficiency testing. So if you're familiar with the actual um, oral proficiency interview, you know, we gather a sample of spoken language in order to rate it according to the guidelines. And we, we, we have both level checks and probes, right? So we wanna find out if the learner can, um, what the learner can do, the highest level of sustained performance, the floor, we also need to identify, identify the ceiling. Now in teaching too, the structure of the OPI suggests an effective way to plan instruction. Warm up, level checks and probes. So activities where the learner is at level or at your targeted level, but also activities that push all of our learners beyond that level. And then a wind down to let our learners feel success at the end. So here's sort of a range of activities um, in a, pause, a lesson plan around, um, around shopping for clothing or clothing. So a warm up might be categorizing voc vocabulary of clothing items into what do you wear in the summer? What do you wear in the winter? What do you wear in the fall? What do you wear in the spring? That would be one way to do it. Or what do you wear at home? What do you wear at work? What do you wear on the weekend? So just to get students manipulating vocabulary and then having them create word fields and adding more targeted vocabulary that you know you're gonna be needing in the next activity. So that's a warm up. A level check, several level check activities. Now this is at level, this is proficiency for a um, class or um, sequence of courses targeting the intermediate level. We might do an information gap around clothing and shopping that elicits simple sentences. Then the students might interview partners about clothing habits and routines. You may provide them with those questions. That would be a way to scaffold that activity. And I'll talk more about scaffolding in a moment. And then they report on their partner to the class. Now to probe the learners for homework, let's imagine that they've read an article, an excerpt from an article about fast fashion, disposable clothing, waste and the climate. Again, they would have been able to read this on their own, take their time, and students bring that to class. Now you structure a group question and answer activity to discuss key ideas in this text. An, a news article about these issues is at the advanced level. It's going beyond personal information, everyday information or topics. And you would also construct questions to push them beyond sentence level, responses and get longer cohesive responses. And you would scaffold as needed. And then you may wind down with students talking about their least favorite clothing item with a group. Now, again, remember, even though we're pushing learners into the advanced level and they may very well be able to perform at the advanced level, that does not mean they're at the advanced level. Rather, it means we're trying to make sure that all of our learners reach our targeted level and, um, and all of them have the opportunity to be sort of stretched. It's almost like um, physical or a sport training. You, you train beyond what you need to make sure you're able to perform the way you need to perform. But in testing, we're going to test at the targeted level. We're not going to test beyond the level because we don't need to know if they're beyond the level. In our Mellon and Language Pedagogy Innovation Projects, we encourage our um, and colleagues to do threshold oral proficiency interviews. So this is a model of what an interview at the intermediate level look up, would look like. If you've had OPI training, you see right away, there are no probes. So if at the end of the first year of my language, when I'm targeting intermediate low, I don't need to test beyond intermediate low because I'm quite sure my learners aren't there. This makes the test shorter, takes less time, and I don't need to find out the ceiling. But keep in mind, this is not an OPI and I'm not going to be able to, you know, really give my students an official OPI rating. But this is the evidence I need to find out if my learners reach my targeted level. So again, we go beyond level when we're teaching, but we test 
at the targeted level. This is the evidence we need. This is the evidence we need in reverse design to know if our curricular, our curricular choices have been, have been um, effective. In proficiency-oriented teaching, we will scaffold often. And there are literally hundreds of ways to scaffold activities. We want to scaffold them to give our learners maximal chances to use language use. So let's look at the role play as a way of thinking about scaffolding. Here's the green intermediate role play card from the actual OPI training role play deck. It's one of my favorites um, for intermediate learners. This is the role play as we rewrite it in our LPII in Mellon with the GRASPS model. You can read more about the GRASPS model here. We put the learner in the situation. You can see some of the language um, repeated there, but we let them know exactly what they need to do. They need to let their friend know. They need to get the information they need. Now, there are other ways. So this would be in a testing situation. But in teaching, I might scaffold this activity. You're studying abroad in Gothenburg. A friend invites you to a party. You need to know um, more details. And I will provide my learners with the question words because I want, we're, we're working on the question words right now and I want them to use them. I'm going to provide those words, that vocabulary for them. That's one way to scaffold. Here's another example. I tell them the questions to ask. Make sure you ask about these details. Is that harder for my learners? You know, this is like a vocabulary test, right? Or is it easier because they don't have to think on their feet about the question? So any way you scaffold will have an impact on the task. Again, thinking about the purpose of these role plays in this case will help you make those choices. Another way to scaffold role play cards or role plays is to let students have time to rehearse. Let them look words up or not. Let them make notes and use notes when they perform. There are many other ways you can maximize a task depending on your purpose. But in testing, we do not scaffold because we want to find out what the learners can do with the language they have learned, right? In that moment in time. So we will not scaffold in testing. We will not provide them with language. By the same token, we will provide feedback when we're teaching and correction sometimes when appropriate and useful. So let's think about feedback and correction. And I'm using a slide now from my um, colleague, Ahmed Durson, who's also here today on understanding formative assessments. So that all the assessments we make while we are teaching, assessments that are very closely related to our curricula. And I'm gonna turn now to, so these are happening when students are still learning. These are help used to monitor and inform the learning process. And I wanna turn also to when correction of oral, oral language is effective. And, you know, we are often, you know, also frustrated when our learners make errors. We we're sure that they know something, but they still make an error. We have to remember an open-ended speaking activity is a very different cognitive task than filling in a discrete form on a test, right? So we know a little bit about when an oral, oral correction will be effective. It, it won't be effective if the learner is not focused on form, if they're more focused on communication, or if they don't have time to consider the correction. And you know, we know our intermediate learners, especially, they're, they're so busy communicating with language, it's very hard for them to take the time to consider the correction. They also, it will probably not be effective if they don't know the rule, if, we, if, we, if they haven't learned the rule yet, or if they can't clarify the rule. And if you're giving oral correction in the target language, if they don't understand that meta language, it's also not going to be effective. So of course the counterpoint, counterpoints are if they are focused on form, and when you do an activity with your learners, you can say, I want you all to focus on the correct form of those plurals. 
or I want you all to focus on those endings. They're focused on the form. And if they're ready to receive the correction, if they know the structure, if they know the rule and have time to digest what you're telling them or the correction you're making. And even more so if they can note the form and verify it at a later time. But in proficiency testing, we do not correct our learners. This is not test teaching right now, this is testing. So we're not going to correct them or criticize them. And we're also not going to praise them. Remember in the proficient, especially in the proficiency oral proficiency interview, we don't want to destroy the conversational nature of that task. When you're talking to someone out in the real world and you ask them how their weekend is and they tell you, you don't say, very good, right? You say, oh, that's so interesting. Tell me about going to that park. What was it like? All right, so same thing at proficiency testing. We just want this snapshot of what our learners can do. And I think all of this helps us think about our expectations, right? So when, if we are going beyond the targeted level or if we are scaffolding an activity, or in terms of our feedback, all of that no, helps us think about our expectations for how well our learners can perform, right? We have to adjust them. Is the material new? Is it learned? Have I provided it, right? Whereas in proficiency testing, we are looking at this performance at the targeted level, and we're going to see different features of performance depending on the activity or the test task and on the full range of performance of our learners. We know that our learners in proficiency testing show very, very different control of vocabulary, of grammar, of comprehension, and proficiency testing and its descriptions are capacious enough to accommodate all of our different learners. Okay, my final um, set of um, topics here, and I think I will be good on time, is our you know, formative and summative testing. And so even though these are both related to testing, I'm gonna make an argument that as my colleague Ahmet did in his um, criteria or description of formative tests, that formative tests are very closely related to curriculum. You know, formative tests, especially achievement tests, are testing what we have just taught. Where summative proficiency tests are testing what learners can do in the real world. And um, both of these, I think, bring us back to the idea of reverse design, especially summative proficiency testing. Remember, our target language use domain is how well our learners can perform in the real world. So first of all, well, we may use discrete or selected response items to check for conceptual control. So for example, um, if we're testing a gra grammatical form or vocabulary, a discrete item, a fill in the blank, a multiple choice is the best way to test whether our learners know that material, whether they have conceptual control, do they know it, right? But in proficiency testing, we are not testing directly grammar or vocabulary. Remember in the very beginning, we're testing their, how our students use learned language to perform functions. So we're, we're using, we're testing the use of that language knowledge in functional language use. So we wanna use constructed response test items, open-ended tables for reading and listening, recall protocols. We want the learners to really show us what they have understood. And we wanna use responses that mimic the kind of listening, the kind of speaking, the kind of writing learners do in the real world. We're not going to, in, in achievement tests, formative achievement tests, we limit the content to the material we just learned. If you taught a chapter on clothing, weather, and shopping, you will limit your content to that material. 
in summative proficiency testing, we don't do that. We've, we've had numerous conversations with colleagues who said, oh, I didn't, oh, I didn't, um, I didn't teach um, that topic. Um, I can't give that as a, as a proficiency test out of, I didn't teach them about uh, what might it be. Um, I didn't, they don't know that language, but any level appropriate topic that the learner would know at the intermediate level, at the advanced level is fair game for testing. This goes back to accountability. We are accountable to providing our intermediate learners with the content and vocabulary and grammar and functional language experiences to prepare them to perform at the intermediate level. There are different implications for advanced level testing. So, but remember advanced level learners when confronted with an advanced level reading text, they should be able to get around unknown vocabulary or unknown structures in order to comprehend it, if it's an appropriate advanced level text. In speaking or writing, of course, we would want to test them on things that they indicate some interest in, in the case of speaking, or we, could, we would expect them to be able to, um, to function in. In our achievement tests, we expect very high levels of accuracy and control. So in discrete testing, we expect high levels of accuracy. We've just taught the material. We are checking their knowledge of that material. We just practice this vocabulary. We just practice this content. We would expect high levels of control in listening comprehension tests that um, recycle the language we've been using through an entire chapter or unit. But in proficiency testing, we see strengths and weaknesses across the assessment criteria. Remember, remember, proficiency testing is criterion reference testing. We have a description of the intermediate mid-level, and we're going to see alert, different learners with different patterns of strengths and weaknesses fitting the same rating, right? So we're looking at that performance and looking at that profile across the assessment criteria of a given level. In achievement testing, for, in our formative test, we give our learners a grade. It's a reflection of their level of accuracy or control. It's, a, it's useful feedback for them. It's useful feedback for us. But in proficiency testing, we're going to give our learners a description of their functional ability. It's a different kind of um, feedback or outcome, and it would be used in a different way. Both of these are meaningful. Both of these are appropriate to the purpose of those tests. And finally, and then again, I hope this circles back to our reverse de design model. Keep in mind though that the, for the format of our formative tests should prepare learners for the summative test. So our form, you know, formative tests are, are fulfilling multiple functions. They're letting us know how our learners are progressing toward our proficiency outcomes. They're also letting our learners know that, how well they're progressing, but they should also prepare our learners for the summative test. So if your learners have never experienced an open-ended listening um, uh, test task, it's really not fair to give them that at the end of the second year of Spanish or the end of the third year of German when they've never been confronted with that. So the formative test should also be giving students practice and preparing them, not just for the tasks on the summative test, but also for the kind of listening or writing or speaking they would do in the real world. And so performance on summative proficiency tests, again, is our evidence of whether or not our learners are performing at our targeted outcomes, our targeted proficiency levels. And again, the effectiveness of our curriculum also helps us know whether changes to our curriculum have had an impact. So now we're back to reverse design, a full circle, and I'm going to close there. And um, thank you for participating and at this point, 
take questions or comments. We have about a little over 15 minutes. Thank you, Kathy. Um, I hope that all of you will join me in thanking Kathy for talking with us today. Um, we do have a couple of questions for you, Kathy. So I'll just run through those. Sure. Um, and okay, so the first one that came up is um, whether assessments are integrated in uh, this is in the Q and A, by the way, if you want to okay. read it. Okay. Um, by definition, aren't assessments integrated in an assessing content slash curricula performance rather than proficiency assessments? I think that you might have talked about this in your presentation already. Mm -hmm. I mean, again, it, starting from the the vantage point of reverse design, right? Mm -hmm. So yes, your assessment gives you the information you need. If, if I've understood your, your um, question correctly and feel free to rephrase it and ask it again if I don't. Coming from the perspective of reverse design, we identify outcomes, we design tests, and then we design curriculum and instruction. When we teach, and then test, those tests tell us a couple different things. They tell us how well, if our learners have reached those outcomes and vis-a-vis -vis that, they indicate whether our design of curriculum has been effective in bringing our learners to those outcomes. Um, without, um, without those tests, we're making assumptions. You know, with this happened, this came up um, in the turn to online teaching, right, during COVID. So several of our colleagues had proficiency oriented, proficiency assessments in place for their end of first year, end of second year curricula. They were able to give the same test at the end of 2020 or the spring of 2020 that they had given in the spring of 2019, telling us whether learners reached the same proficiency outcomes with a semester or quarter of online teaching. So only in having these tests in place is it possible to understand how well our curricula are working mm -hmm. and whether changes we make have a positive or a negative impact. Yeah, yeah. so without any data, we can't really make an informed decision. Exactly, without evidence, exactly. Um, so we have a couple of questions about like U Chicago in particular and how we um, yeah. how we incentivize those tests. So right. can you address? Um, yeah, this like, is a question we get very frequently. Mm -hmm. So one way to do this, we, we do encourage our colleagues, um, not just at the University of Chicago, but any of our colleagues working with us to give those proficiency assessments as final exams at the end of first year, end of second year, wherever they are situated. One way to, um, to incentivize them, we want our learners to take them seriously and we want to get good evidence. So one way to do that is to count them as part of the curriculum and assign point value to them or assign a percentage toward the final grade. But let's say your proficiency assessment is worth 100 total items. Unlike um, an achievement test where you would where, where someone would start losing, you know, that, that test would lose its value or lose its grade starting about the 95th percentile, don't start um, lowering the number of points or percentage until you hit the 80th percentile. You know, back to that slide where you expect high levels of accuracy and control with formative assessments, but we expect a range of performance in proficiency tests. So give a proficiency test, drop down to the 80th percentile, and only at that point does the test have any negative impact on the grade. That's a way to both count it, but also um, incentivize it. That's the, that's the suggestion we've made to our colleagues. Thank you. Um, yeah, and before, actually, before I ask Kathy her next question, I just wanna let everyone know that um, if you would like to ask a question live, you're welcome to do that. We'll, we'll ask you to unmute and then you can ask your question to Kathy. Uh, if you don't wanna type it in the chat, if it's easier to just say it. Um, so as I get through the rest of the questions, just keep that in mind because um, we have, we'll probably have a few minutes at the end. Um, we have another question about the, um, about whether 
programs or courses use performance assessments in addition to achievement tests at the end of the courses or programs? I think that's probably different across programs, but maybe you yeah. can speak to that a little bit. I think for many people, performance assessments are proficiency assessments. I'm not sure what the distinction is between those two. I wonder, I wonder if this person, um, the way that I interpreted the question and Matt, um, this is from Matt. So Matt, if you want to, you can chime in here, but mm -hmm. um, we, the way that I read that question was like a, one of the proficiency exams that we give like at the end of the first year, for instance, mm -hmm. looks a little bit different than a test that students might expect to see like with discrete point exercises and things mm -hmm. like that. Right. So me, that's kind of how I interpreted the question. Right. I mean, that's the point I tried to make that the formative assessments should have similar item types and test tasks um, as the proficiency assessment. You should be preparing them to do well on that assessment if that, if that answers the question. Um, it, I, have, I admit it is a, it is a surprise um, for our students and also for our colleagues when we tell them um, a proficiency assessment does not have a grammar section, right? You don't test grammar in a proficiency assessment. You definitely test it in your formative assessment because you want to find out if learners know that information. You know, um, form, formative assessments, as I said, are doing a lot of different things at once. They're testing knowledge of the language and testing some language use limited to a content area, usually of, of a given chapter or unit, and preparing uh, those students to be familiar with those formats, if that's the, if that's the question, and, and maybe it's not. Mm -hmm. um, Matt, I, I hope that answers your question, but if not, feel free to, um, to ask to unmute and ask. Right. Okay, thanks, Matt. Um, and Claudia just uh, wrote in the chat, performance is what they can do based on what was taught. Proficiency is what they can do regardless. Like the OPI, that is my interpretation. Right, and that right. sounds correct. Perform it sounds like, yeah, more like formative. And do you see Troy's question here, um, Karen, in the q Yes, I do. That was my, that was my next one. Um, yeah, I, see so it. I see it too, right. Um, well, yeah, in testing, um, we use a lot of the um, L1. Um, like the role plays that I shared with you in this presentation. Um, I should have probably mentioned that and I'll mention it now. When we give when I give a role play card to a student, it's going to be in the L1 because, um, because you want to be crystal clear that the learner has understood the task. As you, if you give a student a um, role play card in this, in this example, in the L2, let's say German, first of all, if they can't or don't do the, the, um, the, the role play correctly or well, you don't know if it's because they didn't understand it, in, in which case you've just tested their reading comprehension, or if um, they really can't do the role play task. Secondly, when you write, um, when you present students with test tasks in the target language, you may in fact be giving them language to use. We follow the same process um, or um, format in our um, reading and listening tests. Those test prompts and even test questions are in the L1. So if my learners are listening to a, um, or viewing a video of an exchange in a, um, in a shop, the question in German or in Chinese, the questions are, um, are in the L1 because I, if I ask the questions in the target language, again, if the student answers the question um, incorrectly, I do not know, I cannot know if it's because they didn't understand the question, they didn't read the question, they don't know the vocabulary in the question, or whether they um, didn't understand the listening. So we separate those tasks, um, we separate those languages in proficiency testing. We actually just got a follow-up question about this. Is it okay to give instructions in the L1? Um, Jefferson just wants to clarify. In the L1, sure, it's okay. It's absolutely okay. In fact, we think it's a, we think it's a good best practice for exactly yeah. the reason. And you know, many many people and many many tests, many many um, textbook online tests that you purchase have the questions in the L2. And you know, we see that still going on. But the, the fact of the matter is, if the student doesn't perform, you cannot be completely sure if it's because of their ability to read the question, the prompt, or their listening or reading 
or writing ability, whatever you're testing. Mm -hmm. But um, Claudia actually just followed up in the chat and said, but only in testing, right? Only in testing, right. I mean, sometimes in teaching, you may quickly give your learners instructions in English. It's perfectly allowable. Communicative language teaching made a move toward allowing that, um, that to happen in the classroom. Um, of course, we want the maximum amount of language in the classroom to be in the target language because that is one of the few places where our learners get to hear and interact with the language. We do not though prohibit, I would never prohibit quick use of English to clear something up in order to move into the more expansive uh, language use activity. Yeah, thank you. Um, so we also have a question from Osama, mm -hmm. or Ono Osama. So Great. Osama, I just asked you to unmute yourself. And can he? No. Um, yeah, Osama, Nick, maybe you can help me out. Um, I just asked you to unmute yourself, Osama. So if you can press yes, then you can ask your question. Do you see it? I don't know. Maybe not. <laughs> maybe Nick can chat him. We have another. Um, yes, we have another question in the chat from Mani Jay. Hi, Mani Jay. Um, so never test two skills at the same time? I think toward um, upper levels of proficiency, um, definitely at the superior level. So at the superior level, you may have integrated assessments, right, where your, your students listen to something and write about it in the target language, because at the superior level, we see um, we see that more appropriately. Um, at the advanced level, it, it's, a, it's a question mark. Again, you really have to think about the purpose of your test, all right? Um, now, in some cases, skills are integrated. For example, in a speaking test, the oral proficiency interview, interview most notably, we are, students, our learners are using listening, right, to interact, but that's because listening is integral to speaking in a conversation. Um, but again, it's, it, I would turn that question back to you and ask you what is the purpose of your, of your, um, of your test. Um, you, may you may have students um, you know, listening to a lecture. Let's say, that, let's say you wanna find out whether students are able to um, participate in a, study, a direct enrollment study abroad program in Spain. All right, they're gonna have to be listening to lectures and taking notes and actually they would need to take notes in the target language because they're probably going to need them when they do whatever they're going to do with that material that would be a, a valid way or a valid argument for testing both skills at the same time or integrating those skills yeah and i i also want to draw draw everyone's attention to the fact that this is a different like this, this is a different answer than Kathy would give if the question were, so I shouldn't do multiple things at the same time in the target language in my curriculum, yeah. right? Because- well, not in the curriculum, no. In the curriculum, we're trying to use time efficiently. So, right. um, so you know, we, we want to do as much there as we can, but testing is a different, is a different thing. It's different, exactly. And, and furthermore, to, to, to add on to what Karen just said, in the curriculum, in fact, we, I've given in our workshops examples of activities where learners are reading and writing and listening at the same time doing a vocabulary activity because we know using multiple skills at the same time deepens the processing and makes it more likely that, that language, those language, linguistic forms are, um, are getting into working memory in a reliable way so we can pull them back out and use them. So absolutely integrate skills in, in teaching. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I realized actually that we have a lot of questions about this, the use of L1. Um, I missed yeah. one from Dominique. What about in teaching instruction or in L1 or L2? I would try to teach in, in L2 most of the time. Sometimes, as I said, it's just more efficient to spend a couple minutes doing housekeeping in the L1 and then turn to the target language. Or if your learners are, let's say your learners are doing a paired activity and you hear the same error when you're walking around listening to those pairs. Now you could stop them. You could teach that in the target language, but you might have to spend four or five minutes reteaching it in language. And remember, 
looking back to that oral correction, if the students don't know the target meta language, it's unlikely that feedback is going to help them. You could also stop them all and say, hold on everybody. And then quickly in L1 say, I'm hearing everyone do this. Remember it's that. Okay, keep going. Because what, what your goal is, is to maximize that functional language use that's going on in the classroom. Yeah, and you know, a lot of what I notice here too is that a lot of these questions are like, is it right or is it wrong? And there isn't necessarily yes. one answer to that question. It depends on, the purpose. It right. depends on your context, it depends on your We do know the, the only place I've been able to see that where, where instruction is supposed to happen 100% in the L1 is in the direct method, which is the Berlitz method, which is a method focused on speaking only with very small classes of very motivated learners and an instructor who's always a native speaker. That is the only place I've seen in the literature in the history of language where um, teaching where it's demanded that language is 100% in the target language. Commun as I said, communicative language teaching allows for brief useful, appropriate use of the L1. Yeah, yeah, and I think, I know we're coming up on the end of our time together. So um, one more question, I don't think we're gonna get to everything that's in the chat, um, is what about student responses to reading and listening comprehension in L1? We allow, in, in our proficiency testing, we allow them in the L1, it's the same principle. If you ask them to write them in the L2 and they can't, what's the problem? You don't know if it's because they can't write in the L2 or didn't understand what they just listened to or heard. By allowing them to write responses in the L1, you are getting the full picture of their reconstructed knowledge of that comprehension. And I would say, I, I know this is, this is a topic and we spend time in our workshops, um, to be frank, convincing our peers. And we would welcome you in our initiatives um, to talk more about that and learn more about how that works. I think we're yeah, out of we, time. Yeah. We got, we got to run. Thank you. On behalf of all of our guests, I will clap and say good job. Kathy. My pleasure. A pleasure thank to you see so much for having me. Thank you, Kathy. <laughs> thank you, Karen. Thank you, Chris, our captioner. Um, I will be sending out a, an email to all attendees with um, a link to the recording. And Kathy, your slides, I think. Of and course. if anyone has questions, Hopefully you know where to find us. Thank you all for coming. Such a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, Waterfall in the chat. Thank you all for coming. We appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, bye.